Well, pleasure to be here today and um, return trip, Randy. So thank you and, and uh, let's get started. For the agenda, uh, go ahead for the next slide, thank you. Um, we'll tell you a little bit about Hexion and our sustainable development. Uh, we'll introduce Armor Built Wildfire Shield. We'll talk some about laboratory testing and just to give you an idea, the body of data we've generated so far on Armor Built is just absolutely deep. Uh, we'll talk about installation, service inspection, environmental, uh, do a little comparison with other technologies out there. We'll talk about a little bit about the uh, canyon burn that we did just recently. Well, actually it was uh, October of 22. Uh, we've got some pictures and so forth, then we'll get to questions and so forth. So a little bit about Hexion. Uh, there you go, thanks Adam. Hex, uh, Hexion has been around more than 100 years. It started out as Borden Chemical and then morphed into Hexion with uh, acquisitions and so forth. We've got about 26 uh, manufacturing facilities around the world. We're on most continents, uh, about 1,300 employees. We were about 2,500, but we divested a couple pieces of business in the last couple of years. And our headquarters is in Columbus, Ohio. Sales by segment, you can see that adhesives is there. Our total is about 1.9 billion a year. Uh, you've got performance uh, materials in there. And uh, I mean, Hexion, if you think about it in the timber industry, we literally make billions and billions of pounds a year of adhesives uh, for the timber industry, auto, aircraft, spacecraft, wind energy, um, lots of different things. Sales by segment, you guys can uh, take a look at this at your leisure so we can get to the question piece and won't go through all those. Uh, we're, of course, big in construction, uh, remodels, all that. Sales by geography, pretty big in the U.S. and Canada and so forth. On the left, in picture, you know, our adhesives enable the cost-effective and energy-efficient billing materials. And that's really what we do is we, we build, tweak, modify, uh, build from the ground up molecules that really help industries do what they do in OSB, plywood, MDF, uh, uh, particle board, you, you name it, We're doors, windows, if, if it's got glue in it, there's 65, 70% chance it's us. And then when you think about protecting and hardening the, the critical infrastructure, that's what Armor Built does. We started this in late 2019 and uh, went commercial in 2020. We started with two manual lines, went to four, then six, because it just wasn't enough for the demand. And uh, you can see over to the right, some of our bigger customers that we service in different sectors, uh, manufacturing all kinds of different things, uh, derivatives for Sherman Williams, Axon of Bell, Weyerhaeuser, you name it. Introducing Armor Built, this is a picture to your direct right of the test we did for the proposed wildfire simulation test. And that's 26 feet tall. There's a pole in the middle of that flame. I was thinking, well, I was a little bit cavalier going into that test in San Antonio, but it did fine. It'll pass, Armor Build will pass this test with a single layer or double layer. And to the right of the flaming upside down rocket looking thing, uh, which the pole is inside of, is the Intimest or activated Armor Built formula on, on our fiberglass. And we, we, we build this stuff on a four foot wide fiberglass mesh we blow the holes open with a little bit of passive air so that any wet event around or on the pole, the wind can uh, condense the water away from the pole so that no rot is propagated. Matter of fact, Armor Belt will quite most likely uh, and intuitively extend the life of the pole because it reduces the UV uh, that actually gets to the wood on a wood pole. It activates within 20 seconds. Uh, of the on, on the flame front when it gets to about 380 degrees F it'll start to activate and swell up it does swell around and insulate the wood it prevents burning and strength loss for sure you can see that the wood uh, right over my shoulder and that picture there the wood's not even sunburned and that was 2100 degrees for 10 minutes at nine inch distance we actually uh, got asked by the head of CAL FIRE at one point to do a double burn 
on the same piece uh, with the same uh, wrap, armor belt wrap on it. And we did that. Matter of fact, we didn't do it twice. We did it three times uh, just to demonstrate the efficacy of armor belt and fire protection. So we did the triple burn 2100F for a full 30 minutes and the result was no strength loss and there was the tiniest bit of discoloring at the wood. And what it does, it literally makes the fire equation fail at the interface of the wood pole because the oxygen just can't get to the wood anymore. Go ahead, Adam. Thank you. What you want to key in on here is the protected and unprotected lines on that graph. The protected, of course, is the green line. And that delta there, we'll call it 600C, is just pretty exciting, really, for us how well this protects the wood uh, from heat. So if the, if the ignition point of wood is say 400, we're barely tickling 300 C there. And again, when you look at the pictures, the one just to the left, that's a uh, Southern Yellow Pine CCA, the most flammable block out there, you know, in use for poles and treatment. And uh, that is the test apparatus we use in-house, triple, triple burn, then we have three uh, gas fired impenders that burn on that. The middle picture is the unprotected block and it just with about a four and a half, five mile an hour wind on it and it just ignites and then embers and it'll literally just sit there and turn into ash. The third picture is the protected piece after it's been revealed and you can see and most pieces aren't even this dark but there's no wood loss, no char. Uh, it's just, you know, discolored a little bit. So no strength loss whatsoever. This is a test at Western Fire. They do the same, you know, testing protocol as Southwest Research Institute, although they deliver it with this giant wall of panels, but then a fire ring at the bottom of the pole as well. It's about an 11 footer. So it's a pretty heinous test. So is Southwest Research. We passed them both. We have third party certified reports from both uh, facilities. And that is why some of the biggest utilities in the industry and, and our biggest customers are, of course, in California, where the wildfires are prevalent. 35 years of drought, a uh, lot, lot of fuel, and uh, they have lots and lots of wildfire. Until this year, uh, I think they're going to have a pretty good year for lack of fires, I hope, uh, this summer, uh, based on the amount of weather events they've had down there. They've had 13 weather events, 56 feet of snow. And they've literally rectified 35 years of drought in the last 90 days. So that definitely slowed things down for us. But uh, you hate to see any loss of life or uh, structure. A lot of cost involved. It's ideal for existing poles. A lot of utilities are out there wrapping in the vertical. And they'll go anywhere from uh, 12 to 16, 18 foot high. If it's on a slope, they go a little higher because the the slope fuel can reach uh, and get flame front on the wood. We use inch, one inch crown staples and then inch and a half leg, or you can use a three eighths head uh, ripping nail to put it on. It's pretty, pretty straightforward, pretty easy to do. We have a video that demonstrates the installation on it. And it does allow for service and inspection. You can see that first picture, you can just cut it with a razor knife and lift an inspection port, do your drilling, Osmos, Janix, some of the other folks do this type of thing. There's several out there. They're pretty effective at it. And uh, then you can just drop that flat back down and staple it in place and you're done. Even if you drilled through the armor bill, it will self heal uh, if it's not too big a hole. And it takes quite a bit of surface area of wood to actually catch an ember and, and keep going. But that said, the self healing uh, attribute of it is that when it intermesses or activate, it puffs up and closes the hole. You can see at the one of the Lyman rodeos, the Lyman there is climbing up uh, one of the wrap poles. They really like how their gas feel in the wrap. And we've actually routed out a uh, inch and a half wide by about two inch deep route in a pole section wrapped. And the armor built double wrap will hold in excess of 500 pounds of force uh, on a single gaff. So I don't think there's any 500 pound lineman out there, but like PG&E has a uh, requirement that it has to hold 285 pounds. SCE was, I think, 315 pounds, but uh, we well exceed that. 
the crews can still, you know, do their routine inspections, no problem. Uh, cut with a razor knife, can be climbed. And again, I just said it holds uh, greater than 500 pounds with a single gaff, with no gaff in the wood, just airborne <clears throat> through the armor billet. It's a very, very strong fiberglass mesh. This material, the formula goes on. We have an auto line in Portland, Oregon at one of our facilities, and we just commissioned a second auto line at one of our facilities in Missoula, Montana. So we have plenty of capacity. There's been uh, over 100,000 uh, wood power poles wrapped so far with armor built. You know, from a uh, environmental impact standpoint, it's literally de minimis. And what we mean by that is from the manufacturing standpoint, no materials or chemicals considered hazardous are present in the manufactured product. Armor belt wrap is easily applied with nails or staples. We talked about that. There's no glue or adhesives required. In the E1120 uh, studies, there's basically de minimis leaching, nothing harmful, whatever. Uh, in fact, most of it was non-detectable and there was basically no VOCs uh, in the wrap during, you know, in, in service or during manufacturing. And that's the uh, testament to that formula. Again, in the E1120 leaching study determined that the char, uh, after it's been activated, uh, has no hazardous materials in it. It's basically just carbon. And a lot of folks, after a pull has been through a fire, they don't even take the wrap off. They just brush off the activated intumescent and wrap right over the top of it, which is actually recommended by us because why would you want to spend the labor on pulling a bunch of staples out of a you know wood pole end of life we've got the uh end of life fully certified in that it can be taken to a normal landfill and then a comparison of our coating versus a, a paint on system our system does allow for free movement of moisture through the mesh. I talked about the fact that during our manufacturing process, it comes off a large roll of four foot wide fiberglass, about a 1500 uh, lineal meter roll. And then it goes through a dip tank, up through a vertical dryer for about 30 feet, then into another dryer for nine passes of 216 feet, which fully cures the system onto the mesh. And literally out in the field, after about three months, it takes on the, oh, I would say countenance of the spray on deck liners. In other words, in the back of a pickup truck, if you rake your fingernails across it, it would literally bend your fingernails backwards. It gets that tough. We've run it through uh, QUV, accelerated testing shows the lifespan of greater than 40 years. We actually ran it out past 45 years in quantitative ultraviolet. <clears throat> so we know it works. We also have uh, in the field to the wind applications going in Arizona. Uh, I think one year equals five years in that zone. Uh, so we've got beyond 10 years in the Arizona one. But again, in QUV, it's a very heinous test. It runs 24 seven. We went out past 45 years. It's flexible, easy to apply. Again, staples or nails. You'd want to use a three eighths head nail at least it's uh, it's all really all about trapping fiber to the pole. Now, why do I say that? If you got your some poles in the high wind areas, uh, you don't want to leave anything for the wind to get purchased on and peel that off your pole. It, but it's very tough. Uh, the staples are preferred. You can even get a little backpack uh, of air. <clears throat> they make them now and with the, run the right staples. But nailing's fine as well. Coatings and paints. The utility is really catching on to the fact that these things literally kind of propagate rot because it traps the moisture to the wood, the rain events, the water will go behind the uh, paint and then it can't escape. So at the ground line, things get really tough for it. Effective life is usually five years or less. They can peel and crack and wood moves, let's face it, the poles typically shrink a little bit when they first get out there in the first five, six years. And when they start to pull away, the, the paint's on that original size and it'll start to check and crack. Uh, and it requires reapplication. And then for uh, the next one, Adam, uh, we recently did a wildfire interpretive research council canyon burns that stands for work, W-I-R-C, 
we did this in conjunction with uh, San Diego State University, the National Science Foundation, or Stella Jones Corporation. They're our partner. They're the largest wood power pole supplier in North America. PG&E uh, sponsored donating the poles. We donated the wrap. PG&E got them in the ground. We had eight poles in three prescribed berms that was close berms that were cl close to 3,000 acres total, about a thousand acres each. Uh, Adam's running that video. That's literally a canyon fire uh, that was left unabated. And we did it on purpose because the winds and everything were right. It was in the Gallatin range just outside of Salinas, California. Did that in early October in 22. But it was very successful. We got a lot of data. They flew drones, helicopters. And you'll see in a moment that, uh, wow, that thing just explodes up the canyon. It was really really amazing to watch. Um, you can see on the far left, that was the foliage, you know, marine oak, lots of different uh, foliage around there. And in the middle picture, scorched earth, that's after the burn. That pole in the middle is fully intimest, activated. The pole on the left is just standing there ready to go. This pole is wrapped to the tip. One of our big customers in California wraps all their poles to the tip. And they've got a mandate that if any pole through attrition or damage has to be replaced, if it's in a zone two or three for wildfires, it's automatically replaced with a wrap pole. It, it literally for several hundred dollars, you can wrap a pole like this and uh, versus replacing a pole can be anywhere from 15 to $30,000, depending on location, equipment, crews, union workers, and so forth. But they're really awesome. Uh, to work with. Cal Fire was out there. They were just great and uh, ran the helicopter crews, one to start fires, one to put them out. We had it jump the fence a couple times, but they got it out quickly. The third picture over there is under the wrap. You can see the reveal on the pole. The, the wood is literally basically <laughs> untouched. And that's what this stuff does. It just puff, puffs up and insulates. You can see the back side of the armor belt is not even activated. And this, this did hit, we know for a fact, about 1,940 degrees F in that fuel load you're looking at right there. It lasted probably five or six minutes with the, uh, the, the, fu the fuel density of this particular one. And this was one of eight. Go ahead, Adam. This pole actually uh, went through the mosquito fire in the background, you can see three vehicles, a, a, a car down below, an RV in the middle, and another car more toward the pole. The pole is basically, other than a couple of trees, few trees standing, it, it, it's basically unharmed. What you're looking at there is not a black pole. It is the fully intimest armor built on that pole. They didn't cut it away and do a reveal on it, but the, I can tell you that the aluminum wheels on those vehicles melted. That's how hot that got. So it had to be north of say 2400F uh, as it, as it uh, condensed with the fuel, uh, literally gasoline fuel and so forth that was in those vehicles. And that pole is absolutely perfectly fine. And we've had lots of poles go through fires already. Like I said, there's probably 110,000 of them wrapped out there. You got folks like BC Hydro, SAS Power, uh, PG&E, uh, NV Energy, City of Reading, Chelan, all kinds of utilities are using it. Go ahead, Adam. So to, to frequently ask questions, this this is really <clears throat> what we've run across doing these type interviews before. Uh, can you use this material to wrap tower structures and so forth besides wood? Yes, we've done metal structures that are used for backup power generation around cell towers. 85% of all calls for emergencies go over cell phones now. Uh, and and it, it'll keep the temperature inside the uh, power backup and software, hardware running software to keep all the calls going uh, below 150 C. So that's really what they wanted. We were able to achieve it. Uh, it does help protect from woodpeckers out of 110,000 poles. We've only seen one time where a woodpecker had the tenacity to make a small hole in it. It was a little bigger than a golf ball and they never came back because it, it, I'm sure it doesn't taste very good, but at the same time, it's very difficult to get through. It's very tough. Woodpeckers 
destroy between 11 and 17,000 poles a year, by the way. So there's people in the boreal forest uh, in the eastern U.S., down south, and North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, Minnesota. There's woodpeckers all over the place. And they really love to beat on poles. They do it for nesting, for resonance, to attract mates. Because on the pole easement, their sound carries a long way. So they think they're really tough and cool when they can make that sound go that far. But it really does help for woodpeckers. How does the product hold up to weathering in northern climates? It's fine. I mean, freeze thaw doesn't affect it at all. It's basically inert. <clears throat> Road salts and alkalinity of that type in the east, you know, Midwest, east, all that kind of stuff. They use a lot of uh, salt on the roads. It's impervious, including farmers' chemicals. When when the rat poles are in fields and they're spraying, you know, for weeds and so forth, it doesn't affect it. Um, it will not break it down. Uh, how long? Oh, before it's replaced. Well, like I said, the QUV study we've done, and and it, it's and we burned it after we burned a piece every year. Uh, for however long it took, it was a ratio of 17 to 1. So one week in the quantitative ultraviolet chamber equals 17 weeks to the wind or out, out in the world. And uh, I mean, to me, we don't really know how long it'll last, but I would guess it's beyond 50 years. The wrapping cost, we talked a little bit about that. I mean, literally, it's several hundred dollars on a pole. If you go all the way to the tip, it's a few hundred dollars if you go into that you know, 16 to 18, 24 foot range, <clears throat> but certainly cheaper than losing the pole to wildfires or having crews go out there and replace pole. When you install the wrap, do you have to dig around the pole? It's preferred that you go down uh, eight to 12 inches. That way, if there's any slough uh, around the pole, when they put a new pole in, sometimes the dirt will slough, slough, slough down and make a place where fuel can uh, aggregate. And you don't want that. So normally we do dig around and go down six to 12 inches and then bury it back. Uh, do the pole treatments react with armor built? No, no. Pentachlorpin, you know, CCA, DCOI, none of them have shown to react with the armor built at all. In fact, from a chemical standpoint, we've checked it in our analytical lab and basically soaked armor built in all those different treatments because we have access to all of them through Stella Jones and, and basically it's impervious. Does it protect against cold temperatures? Yes, indeed it will. Uh, freeze thaw, no problem. Super hot, no problem. Uh, that's where we're at. I mean, it almost sounds a little too good to be true, but uh, the bottom line is it really works well. We really didn't know what we had until the utilities became so uh, enamored with it. And uh, again, one of our biggest customers is PG&E. And then there's, oh gosh, probably, I'm guessing, between 60 and 90 other utilities. Go ahead, Randy. I think we're ready for questions. Do you have CSA or ULC approvals for the wrap? You know, CSA, I'm, I'm not sure if they require any approvals for an application like this. We're very familiar with the Canadian Standards Association because we have lots and lots of certifications with CSA. But uh, the bottom line is we have the uh, Southwest Research Institute certification for wildfire, Western Fire certification out of Kelso, Washington. And we've looked into UL, they're able to do it. We've got uh, two so far, um, but we are considering going to UL. They're a very well-respected well uh, testing outfit. So we may indeed do that. Okay. Uh, will direct sunlight affect the wrap properties? You know, once the formula reaches what we call full coalescence and just replace the word coalesce with cure. So like I said, it, when you first get a fresh piece of armor built in your hand off the auto line, it's very pliable and it'll stay pliable even after years. Uh, once it gets into direct UV for about three, four months, it really starts getting uh, much tougher, but it's actually still flexible on the fiberglass mesh. Now that said, the outside of it, and remember you've got armor built formula on the inside of the wrap and the outside of the wrap, and it's got little holes in it all over the place 
that were there in the fiberglass mesh when we bought it. And then we blow those holes back open after it comes through the dip tank through the uh, doctor bars. We know how much we have to put on there from an application rate standpoint. And that is slightly higher than what passed all these third party certifications. But that said, it literally will become so tough. It's very, very difficult. Like if you tried to scratch it with your fingernails, it wouldn't go well for you. It, it's really, really tough, but it does not crack. It's in a cylinder on the pole. It doesn't just crack and fall off the wind wind blowing sand on it. Uh, Mother Nature will have its way with anything. Uh, so I'm not going to be as bold as to say that if you had enough sand blowing across the, the bottom, you know, third of this thing, it would eventually take a little bit off of the outside layer. But again, remember that we put an equal amount on the inside of the arm bill, which will intermass right through the holes to the outside that we've seen very, very, very little uh, weight loss, even in high wind areas where there's sand. Okay, is this armor built material for house applicate house wrap applications? You know, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. We are right now working with the uh, uh, the Wire S consortium, and that is an outfit working with the head of Cal Fire and Cal Fire Associates and Dr. Steve Quarles and the woman that has her hands on the purse strings for the $640 million in California, for example, and another hundred million from the Fed. We have prototypes ready and we just passed last week E84 30 minute extended. We had a smoke gen number that was below, I think 25 or maybe that was five. Anyway, we had, uh, well, certainly we passed the E8430 minute and, uh, and the smoke gen was really, really low. Now that said, uh, Dr. Quarles, the, the folks from Cal Fire, contractors were there, uh, some distrib distributors were there. They are all excited. I just talked to three distributors yesterday that want to uh, uh, have it in their warehouses. Cal Fire and communities are out there right now certifying subcontractors to put them on, put the stuff on houses. Where it would go is in the roof to dormer valleys where the metal flashing is uh, to keep from uh, having the house catch on fire from flying burning embers. That's a huge problem. Even though the house is abated from fuels and all this stuff, flying burning embers is normally what gets these houses to go. Or oh, so they do roof to dormer applications, uh, hip roof type uh, conjunctions so where where the roofs come together on angle to a low spot debris leaves needles pile up in there and then the flying burning embers catch that on fire so it would go in there <clears throat> so these contractors would peel back a little uh, bit of the shingle put in armor built underneath and over the top of the flashing same with roof to dormer and then reapply the shingles it also would go up underneath in the open eaves because there's a lot of fence line fires, the fence catches fire and then the flames reach up and catch the open eave on fire and then burn the house down. And then from a ground line perspective, they would take off a couple courses of siding, put the arm belt right up underneath it, put the siding back on and drop the arm belt right down the ground line. And you can paint this. You can literally paint armor built before it's activated with any color you want, it'll hold the paint. And it looks pretty cool, actually. Does the paint uh, become a fuel? No, actually, it doesn't. It, it, when, when the fire comes, it actually just kind of bubbles. And then once the arm bill activates, because these aren't paints with a lot of flammable materials in them anyway. They're just right. not. They, mm -hmm. don't, they don't really allow those anymore. These are not like uh, fuel loads really, or they're not considered fuel loads. It just bubbles and when it, when it activates, it just stops the fire from getting to the siding or underneath the siding. So okay. those are the three applications. They call it commercial residential uh, re uh, uh, exterior retrofit. So that's a market these folks are very excited for us to finish our efficacy work and get into. Uh, do you know, or have you tested the electrical insulation properties of this material? Yes. Uh, armor built has been proven to be no more conductive than a wood pole with nothing on it. 
We know that for a fact. We've had it done by third party uh, three different times. And uh, obviously, even wood poles after a wet event are more conductive than a pole that's dry, but they're not conductive enough to carry a current to ground. Uh, same for Armabil. What is the relative compar comparative cost between armor built for a pole and replacing a pole? Well, I think I mentioned earlier that uh, we've heard numbers as high as $35,000 to replace a pole. Now, this would be a hard to get to, a lot of manual stuff, drag it up, you know, hook up, <laughs> block and tackle and get it in the ground. Mainly, you know, they can get equipment up there and boom it into the hole. But you're talking about union lineman crews. It's literally several hundred dollars to wrap a pole to the tip. Uh, we've even invented a water impervious cap that would stop arcing to the dust accumulation that has metallic ion in it. The people in the south get a lot of that uh, are really, they're starting to use it just for pole caps. Uh, so we've got a 40 mil butyl that goes underneath the armor belt and then wraps the tip and is stapled down. And it just really grabs the tip nice and clean. And uh, yeah, so relative cost, I mean, it would be minimum probably 15000 to replace a pole versus several hundred dollars to do it wrap. Right. Okay, do do pole, do all pole, all distribution poles need to be wrapped or just the ones in high, uh, high risk areas? Well, I mean, all poles do not need to be wrapped. Right. That's just the bottom line. I mean, you know, you've got inner city, all that stuff, but say in California, how many miles outside of a city are you before you're in a zone two? Not very many. Uh, and there's lot, lots of wildfires in and around cities in, oh gosh, all over California. Let's be yeah. honest. Look at Red Bluff, the, the whole skirt of those towns or any of those places. There's lots and lots of fuel out there and it's very dry. But anything that's zone two or zone three, uh, you would want to want to have those poles wrapped. But then again, the fuel load height, right? The height of the fuel, you want to, as a rule of thumb, wrap to about three times the height of the tip of the fuel around the pole. So if you've got, you know, four foot high fuel and chaparral, sagebrush, what have you, grasses, you'd want to wrap to at least 12 feet. And even if the flames are licking at the uh, wood just above it, they can't get enough purchase based on the amount of time the fuel would be on, in flame to light an ember that pole to the extent it would catch and burn. That's typically rule of thumb. That would be true probably a sigma amount of time, 96.6% of the time, that pole would be fine with four foot fuel wrapped to about 12 foot. Okay, do you believe you may be able to achieve a two hour UL fire rating on various materials? Yes, we've done it. We, okay. we did it in house to the UL standard. All right. And we know we're, we're we know we're running about 180 degrees F higher than what they do, and we do that on purpose. Here's a good question: Have you pre-wrapped poles before installation? Yes, there's been of that 110,000 that are wrapped and out there now, about 80,000 of them were wrapped in the horizontal by Stella Jones. They have wrapping crews in Tacoma, uh, Fresno, Eugene, Oregon. They store it in McClellan Park, but they don't wrap there. And also Carsland, BC. Is they it have more, wrapped at all of them. Is it more efficient to do it that way? This is for new pole installation, correct? Yeah. Well, yeah. It, it would be if you're wrapping in the horizontal. Right. And I mean, a lot of utilities, they don't wait for these poles to tip over. They, they go out proactively and wrap. Uh, or I mean, excuse me, replace poles based on attrition or age, right? So yeah. they, they know when they need to go out there and get them done. And if they're replacing poles, most of the utilities have mandates that if it's in a zone two or three, especially in California, they put in a wrap pole, period. Mm -hmm. That's that. So the lineman, it's just a prescribed way to do things. But yes, in the horizontal, it is easier, faster to do. But wrapping in the vertical to, to you know, 3X the fuel height, is not difficult at all. In fact, we can send everybody here a uh, video link that shows our uh, installation video. It's pretty simple stuff. Yeah, Adam, why don't, if you have that video link, Adam, why don't you drop it in the chat so everyone can see the video link if you have it uh, handy. 
All right, is the wrap on poles reusable? Another good question. You know, I mean, reusable, they, you know, once you put a bunch of nails or staples in it, I, I, I would say if it was nailed on, nails are a lot easier to get out, get out of the wrap and pull than staples. Staples just make kind of a mess. You'd have to really have a straight line of staples uh, cut with a razor knife down the line. But yeah, you, you could literally reuse it. Um, our thought would be, it, it, you'd pretty well chew it up and do some damage to it, getting it off the pole. Yeah. But uh, I'm not sure it would be worth the labor on a break even right. standpoint to get it off and reuse it. Yeah. Probably it's not designed for that purpose. Okay. Do you have Hydro One approvals or local utilities approval for Ontario, Canada? Oh, uh, we just. We just got Sask Power, but they're in Manitoba, I believe. Saskatchewan. Now, or Saskatchewan. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, sorry. I, That's my, okay. You know, it's just a it's, little off. You know, it, I, my apologies. If, 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 if you've been to there. Saskatchewan, it looks an awful lot like Manitoba. Yeah, well, if you don't own about 5,000 acres of dry weed up there, you're nobody, right? <laughs> yeah. But anyway, uh I, I don't believe there's anybody up there using it yet, but I know they have some serious fires and high oh, yeah. winds up there at times. And so to protect your systems, uh, you know, we we can get you as much wrap as you want. We've got plenty of capacity. Cool. And again, based on your fuel load, you wouldn't have to go that high. Alberta as well. You know, Fort McMurray, the whole town just about burned down Indeed. a few years ago. Yeah. And, and we do have some uh, utilities in Alberta using it for sure. And we see as well. Okay, uh, there's no more questions. So thank you very much, Scott. Excellent presentation, as always. Good questions, everyone. 